What did Jesus do the last week before he was crucified? I wonder if you could list the things he did, the places he went, and even what he taught. Well, today on the Gospel Message radio program, we're in the Palm Sunday weekend, and we want to look at the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. And I hope that will be an encouragement for you this next week to turn your hearts, your thoughts, and your mind to Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, what he went through when he was crucified, and also that he rose the third day. It's wonderful, my friends. Jesus is alive. But today, the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. Before we go into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time on this radio program. I pray for each listener that they would be encouraged, that they would be strengthened, and that they would grow in their relationship with you through this program. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide each word, and that your name would be honored and glorified, and we would remember the great sacrifice you made for us, for our sins, so we could have a relationship with you, so we could be forgiven, and we could have eternal life forever with you, Jesus. Thank you again for giving us this opportunity on this radio program, and I pray this in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we want to start with the first day, Sunday, and Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And I want to read from Matthew from a Jewish perspective today. This account is actually found in all four Gospels. But let's start with Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. It says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, and unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. And this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting on an ass, and the colt the fool of an ass. And the disciple went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem on this Sunday. This is a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And we know Jesus fulfilled many prophecies. And it's interesting, this idea of Jesus, the Son of God, on this day celebrated as a king, as a savior, and yet would be crucified the same week. The people who were shouting, Hallelujah, Hosanna, did not know what was about to come, that Jesus would be crucified. But Jesus knew. He knew while he was riding on this donkey, and the people were praising him, that he would stand before judgment, that he would be lied about, beaten, whipped and crucified. And I think there's a lesson for us today. Often there's something that happens, something really positive, really good, and we think we're on top of the world. And things will always be like this, and we're the best. And we know it can be a short time later, and everything changes. Everything positive is gone. And we're so surprised we don't understand. This happened to Jesus the week before his death. And if it happened to him, it can happen to us. On the first day of the week, they were cheering Jesus, praising him. And on the fifth day, they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. We also believe that on this Palm Sunday, Jesus and his disciples spent the night in Bethany, a town about two miles east of Jerusalem. This is where Lazarus, whom Jesus has raised from the dead, and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived. They were close friends of Jesus and maybe hosted him and his disciples during their final days in Jerusalem. So let's go to Monday. What happens Monday? 
Let's read from Matthew 21, verses 12 to 17, where Jesus clears the temple. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out into the city of Bethany and lodged there. So we see Jesus comes to the temple and he founds the courts full of corrupt money changers. They had made the temple a place to sell and buy goods, a place to make money, a place to take advantage of the poor. And here we see the righteous anger of Jesus, overthrowing tables, chasing people out. And we know that the temple or the church of God should be a house of prayer. It should be free for everyone to come. It should never take advantage of the poor, rather to help those that are in need and be there for those that are hurting. And I wonder what we would say of our churches today, or what Jesus would say if he would come into our churches. Maybe we're not literally buying or selling things, but have we made the church an organization where the money we have, the building we have, how much money we can get together is the way we look at the success of the church. We have made merchandise of people instead of loving people and bringing them to Jesus. Here on this Monday, we see the righteous anger of Jesus. And then later in the day, he's hungry and sees this fig tree with no fruit and he curses the fig tree. He tells it to die because it failed to bear fruit. Some scholars believe this cursing of the fig tree represented God's judgment on the spiritually dead religious leaders of Israel. Others believe that this symbolism extended to all believers, demonstrating that genuine faith is more than just outward religion. True living faith must bear spiritual fruit in a person's life. But Jesus makes it clear, those that doubt will not receive anything, and those that pray in faith will receive what they ask for. What a powerful promise on the Monday before his crucifixion. Are you praying in faith, my friend? And so on Monday evening, Jesus stays in Bethany again, maybe again in the home of his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Let's go to Tuesday, where Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples, Tuesday morning, they come back to Jerusalem, and they pass this withered fig tree. And then Jesus again talks about the importance of faith. And then they come back to the temple, the same temple, probably the same temple that Jesus had chased people out of. And the religious leaders were upset that Jesus had done this. And Jesus speaks judgment over these leaders. We find this in Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 to 33. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within ye are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. And he goes further to express this judgment on these scribes and Pharisees. The last verse, he says, Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Verse 33. It's interesting, the week before Jesus' death, and he knows he's going to die, he doesn't avoid conflict. He goes right back into the temple and speaks this judgment over the scribes and Pharisees. And I think sometimes that's the way it should be in our lives. 
instead of avoiding conflict or praying for no conflict, we should pray for courage to stand up for the right things at the right time. Jesus, knowing that these were exactly the people that were going to plan to kill him, spoke this judgment on these hypocrites, these people that wanted to make a good impression from the outside but were full of sin on the inside. And Jesus is harder on these people than those that were living in sin. This woman caught in adultery, Jesus says, go and sin no more. Zacchaeus, this tax collector, Jesus changed his life forever. Later that afternoon, Jesus leaves the city, goes with his disciples to the Mount of Olives, which sits due east of the temple and overlooks Jerusalem. And here Jesus gives a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the age. He speaks as usual in parables using a symbolic language about the end time events, including his second coming and the final judgment. Scripture indicates that this Tuesday was also the day that Judas Iscariot negotiated with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus. It would have been interesting for Jesus to see Judas gone, maybe for a few hours, maybe for a whole day, and knowing exactly what he was doing, what he was planning. And then Judas coming back into the group and Jesus welcoming him back, knowing what Judas had done. So that's a little bit about Tuesday and now Wednesday. And the Bible doesn't say a lot about what Jesus did on the Wednesday of the Passion Week. Some say that Jesus and his disciples spent the day resting in Bethany. But we don't really know what happened on Wednesday. So let's go to Thursday, the Passover and the Last Supper. Let's read from Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 35. It says, Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at the house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray him. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my cup of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. That evening, Jesus had this last supper with his disciples. He washed their feet and he has this Passover and he gives us an example of communion, remembering the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I hope you this week can read this story for yourself and put yourself into the life of Jesus the last week before his crucifixion. It's incredibly important for us as Christians to remember the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He died so we could be forgiven and free from sin. My name is Wes Hepner. You've been listening to the gospel message. And my prayer for you would be that you would take this week to read and pray and remember what Jesus did for you. The gospel message is a listener supported ministry. Our address is Box 1760, Warman, Saskatchewan, Canada, SOK4SO. Our phone number is 306 230 7807. And our website where you can give online or listen to messages is gospelmessageradio.com. God bless you.